All right, so we have been in a series called Infinite and Intimate, and today we turn ourselves towards the cross. You have heard during the worship set the, um, the story of the crucifixion, and it's an important reality that we face, that if we Christians want to know God, there's a cross, and there's the death of Christ that we must reckon with, and in reckoning with it, what we understand is that Christ's work on the cross was altogether sufficient to forgive us of our sin. This infinite God, who is the creator and sustainer of all the universe, of all things, this creator, infinite God, is also an intimate God who died for you and I. But he didn't just die for you and I. There's a missional aspect to our lives, and we're going to talk about it today. The best way to talk about it is to really dive in right into John chapter 20, 1 to 18. It's a good-sized chunk of Scripture, and we're going to read it, and we're going to stop a few times and talk about it, because what we find, even in the deepest, like, most significant moments in the gospel— we find human competition and different elements of our own nature rising up, even in good people. So uh, follow along as we read this. John chapter 20, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Is that weird to anybody else? That on Resurrection Sunday, John was like, by the way, I'm faster than Peter. Like, does anybody else find that odd? I when when you read that, so let's read. They've heard that Jesus' body has been removed. So Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. It was an equal start, no false start. Both were running, but I outran Peter. I am John, the quickest of the two. How weird is that? But it does remind us that even in these beautifully significant moments in the gospel where Christ is resurrected, having grabbed death by the throat and the keys to hell and said, redemption has come, John's worrying about who's got quicks. Aren't we always us as humans? And it gives you hope to realize that even in our humanity and our brokenness, God can do magnificent things with the quick ones and the slow ones. John was the last disciple to be alive. All the others died a martyr's death. John had been persecuted and tortured many times, but he lived the longest. And he was a great saint of God, but he included that about himself. And I wonder if he put it in there because there was a part of him that recognized his own brokenness and what mattered then maybe wouldn't matter that much after he experienced seeing Jesus. He bent over. He looked at the strips of linen lying there. So John runs up, bends over, looks in the tomb, sees the strips of linen lying there. Then Simon Peter came alongside of him and went straight into the tomb and he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, he does it again. I just think, like, it just points out the selfish nature. And I just, I don't know why I love that in this story, but it's such a raw human element. The one who beat him there, the one who's faster. Just keep remembering, how often do we compete over things that have no significance or point in the story? It's not a main part of the sermon. I just can't help but not say it. Okay. All right. Also, he went inside. John went inside. He saw and he believed. They still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, Mary stayed behind. The disciples went back. John and Peter went back. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels dressed in white, and they were seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Not only was it enough that they crucified and flogged the Lord Jesus Christ and then ran a spear up into his, into his organ chamber. No, not only that, but now they've taken him and I can't find him. 
There's just, just this absolute sense of if this wasn't bad, this is even worse. I can't find out where they've taken him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. Remember, her preconceived idea would be the flogged and crucified with the crown of thorns, wrecked body of Jesus Christ. She wouldn't turn around and recognize him because she was expecting him to be in a certain state. He asked her, woman, why are you crying and who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, If you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending. Now catch the wording in this. I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. This almighty, infinite God is being reduced, not in in stature or person, but being brought into an intimate relationship, my Father and your Father, my God and your God. So there's this amazing moment. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Quite often we don't understand that um, the tomb matters. The tomb matters in the story of the crucifixion, the life, the death, and the resurrection. It represents something. Have you ever, and, and Erica and I have figured out we're dorks on vacation. We like to go to tombs. Because I, when I sat down and I looked through the tombs that I've been to on vacation, Washington's at Mount Vernon, Kennedy's tomb at Arlington, the tomb of the unknown soldier, the National Cemetery in Arlington, that we've been to Peter's tomb in St. Peter's Square at the Vatican, and, and it's amazing, Peter's buried under the Vatican, and upon this rock I will build my church, but I'm just saying. Um, so there's, there's that there. There's personal tombs. We live near a cemetery. There's historical relevance to tombs. We go to like a Washington. I remember standing at Mount Vernon and looking at George and Martha's tombs and thinking like, what would he think of America now? What would he think now? What, what goes through your head when you stand at these tombs? And we recognize them as such a place of finality, aren't they? Having lived across the street from the cemetery for a number of years, there's a beauty and an agony to living there because you will see people walking through the graveyard and they will kneel down by a grave and spend considerable time there and they will wander off quietly, not aimlessly, but hard to get traction. And they walk away with their thoughts inside of them because someone they love is there and they had to leave them there. There's a finality to tombs, but not with us, not with Christians. And what we recognize in this is why we often go to tombs is to grieve and to honor and pay respect to someone we love, someone we lost, or maybe a life well lived. But we understand that Mary was going with a different intent. She was going with all the spices and the oils to anoint the body of Christ for his full and proper burial. And as she got there, she recognized everything was different. She went there to grieve and probably endure and try to process and to cry and to scream about what she's trying to live with, the memories, the visuals of seeing Christ on the cross, altogether physically butchered by the Romans. And, and wrestle with that. That's why she was there. But the reality is, when we come to the tomb, knowing it's no longer a place of finality, we recognize if we're looking in the tomb for answers, we're looking in the wrong place. Mary had come to the wrong place. Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She was in the wrong place. She didn't know that this Well, she didn't realize that we would stand here today and say that there's no known tomb for the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no place where you can go and find the body and the bones of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because you heard the story. He is not here. He is resurrected just as he told you he would. He is not present in the grave. And what we recognize quite often is we make the same mistakes as Mary and we run back to places of finality and brokenness to find answers in our own life. 
Don't we do that? Don't we fixate on the past which we can't repair? Have you ever done something in your life and you wished instantly upon doing it, you could undo it? Right? You just, oh man, I wish I could change that. And undo what was done, but you can't. But we can fixate on our broken past, the tomb of a broken identity and sinful life, and we can lose the life we're called to live for because we're looking in the wrong place. Our eyes should be fixed on the author and perfecter of our faith, not the things that broke us. The things that broke us are a beautiful reminder of the work he's done, but they are not our purpose any longer. They are not who we are. So we find that Mary is looking in the wrong place. And I believe that Jesus meets us in the tombs of life. And he is the one who has been doing this work from the very beginning of speaking order and light and life over the chaos of our lives. Remember the original text in Genesis, over the waters, the chaos, the spirit of God hovered, and the very first word of creation, the first word of creation is Jesus, and he speaks order and distinction and light and life, and it comes forth abundantly. I believe he speaks today, just as he did before. But the problem is we're not listening when we're fixated on the tombs of things we think are final, but they're not final. They are redeemed in Christ Jesus, and he can take even the brokenness of our past and use it for his glory. What do we do when we recognize that there is someone who loves us, someone who is intimately invested in us? What we have to realize is Jesus gives an answer to Mary. I mean, do you think she wanted to stay there? Imagine with me. You go to a tomb looking for someone or a marker of them, and they're standing there talking to you. What would that feel like? Would your mouth hang open a little and be like, oh, what's up? <laughs> right? Nobody expects that. We we're all like, yeah, she would have been fine. No, it would have been crazy. It would have been crazy in her head when he said, Mary. But she has this kind of guttural response, you know, this thing that comes out of her before any filter or anything can be said. She says in Aramaic, teacher, I know you, and you're in the wrong place. And Jesus kind of replies, no, 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 you are. Go. Get out of the tombs and go tell them I'm alive. Ooh, I love that. I think it's awesome because for us, it means that our tombs, our brokenness, our sin, all these things that define us are actually oh, shattered in the blood of Christ. And in his resurrection, we become people who are called to go. Jesus says to Mary, don't hold on to me. Don't hold on to me. You go tell people about me. You go tell my brothers that I'm going back to my God and your God and my father, and their father. Like, do you get the kind of resident power of this calling, this go? Jesus' first words after his resurrection was to turn the gospel loose in the life of a woman who had been a prostitute. Your past can't be that bad, right? How legitimately awesome does it feel to know that that's what Jesus did? Where there was a tomb, he said, don't hold on to me. Go, tell them who I am. Let me be the light of the world through you. You go tell them they have seen me, that you have seen me. And she goes and tells them, and there's this one, Thomas. And St. Thomas, he, he's one of the disciples. And what does he say? So excited that Jesus has been resurrected. When she comes back and says, I have seen the Lord, he says, I won't believe it until I see the hole in his side and the holes in his hands. Telling us this, you are gonna tell people about Jesus and they're not gonna believe you. But here's the hope. Jesus appeared even to Thomas. And he said, go ahead. Put your hands in the holes. Feel my side. I am who I say I am. How bad do you think Thomas felt? I wish I believed Mary, right? Because he's doing this thing that's like, oh, and Jesus said, blessed are you who believed having not seen. Right? And he's kind of talking to Thomas like, why did it take you seeing me to believe what I had always been saying? It reminds us this go, this intrinsic um, sending of the gospel reminds us that if we are here to stay the same, we're in the wrong place. 
Because we've got to be going where Christ leads. We've got to be doing that which pleases the heart of God. So let's apply this. Let's look at this maybe through a different lens. An intimate relationship of infinite proportions. Have you ever thought, and hopefully with this series you have, about the infinite God knowing your name? Like if someone said to me, hey, John Elway asked about you the other day, I would start crying. I'd be like, he knows me? I would be so happy. Even if the Broncos are a horrible football team, even in college, they're bad. But if John Elway knew me, I'd be like, yes, I'm awesome. It'd be the first thing I put on Facebook. I would start a Twitter. I'd be like, John Elway's my friend, BFF. (laughs) Yeah. Why? Because he's the man. I love him. He was my favorite quarterback. I, whoa, it'd be awesome if he knew my name. And then we're like, when it comes to God, we kind of act like, yeah, he knows us. How is this not what we talk about? How is this not who we are? Your intimate relationship with the Lord is seen most clearly in what he did at the tomb, where he removed the finality of death and gave purpose back to all the brokenness, and gave you purpose in a life to live with him. Your purpose in Christ is that you live with him for his glory. What we see is that when Jesus Christ calls Mary, Mary, I mean, Peter and John had already been there. Why did he choose Mary? I don't know. I just know this, that there's this intimate portrait of Jesus going, why are you crying? Who, who here would like, you don't have to show your hands, but who would like to have Jesus ask you that question today? Because there's been a lot of tears in your life. Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Why are you crying? See, there's this intimacy that should be happening. Mary, when she sees Jesus, had been walking to the tomb, head down, heartbroken, and her shoulders kind of slumped under the weight of the world. The Messiah had been crucified, Rome had won, empire was king, and she was lost. Oh, until when? Rabbi, I know you. How do you think she looked when she ran away from the tomb? I think she was like, all right, I'll see you later. No, that's what Eeyore does, not Mary. Right? Mary would have been on her horse. She'd have been like, oh, my word. Okay, I'll go. And she would have bolted. She would have left the tomb looking different. And how many Christians walk around like, I love Jesus, praise God. And we look so miserable. We have no joy in the fact that in the dead places of our life, Christ removed their finality and poured in his life. We should have an intimate change to who we are. If you're coming to stay the same, this isn't faith. If you're coming to be made into the image of Christ, that's faith. That's faith that his salvation work and his redemptive work in you can come about. That's a life of faith. And something in you should change in the same way it changed with Mary. Your demeanor should change the same once you meet Jesus. Your demeanor should shift from this down, gloomy brokenness to at least a hopeful reality that you're not left to your own sin and punishment. Something personally in you should be changing and transforming and changing what you talk about and changing what you're focused on because the Lord Jesus Christ has called you by name and he has removed the permanent stain of the tomb and called you into eternal life with him. There's not much better news than that. Why would we ever not change? Of course we should change. And if you're not changing, you need to ask, am I really worshiping Jesus Christ? Because change is part of that when Almighty God gets into your life. The second thing is there should be an infinite effect on your life, an effect to the world around you. This isn't just for you. An infinite effect. You should be sharing the gospel in every sphere of influence that you have. You should desire and seek and work for opportunities to tell people about Jesus Christ just like Mary did. Do you think Mary got back and like, how's it going? Pretty good. I mean, I'll tell you later. No! She came back and she was probably screaming before she came through the door. I can't believe it. I'll tell you why. She was excited. The tomb had no hold. 
She had been sent by the one who conquered death and hell. And so have you. I talked to a lady after first service. And she said to me, I'm going to do it this year. And I was like, I don't know what it is. I, I, you know, it was kind of a pause there for a minute. And she said, I'm going to tell my whole family about Jesus at Thanksgiving. And it might ruin it. And I was like, ooh, tell me more. Right? There's a part of me that's like, you're going to ruin Thanksgiving? That is awesome. That is great. Why, why wouldn't you? And I was just, I was so excited. I forgot to pray for her. I was just like, go. I, I was so happy because she's willing to blow it up because she said, I've waited 16 years, and after this, I can wait no more. And I was like, go get them. I love it. That should be our heart. We should be willing to tell people about Jesus Christ and his infinite impact on this world through an intimate relationship with us. Your life should be winning people to Christ. You should be telling people about Jesus because you were sent in the same way Mary was. No more excuses. So the final application is invite those you know. Do what that young lady said she's going to do this Thanksgiving. Invite people you know to come to know Christ. Jesus says in John 20, 31, but the, um, or John says, but these are written that you may believe in Jesus and that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. How many people do you know that need life in his name? And are you not the hands and feet of the gospel sent forth? How now do we live with a gospel that calls us to such a life? Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be witnesses to your work and your word active in this world. Lord, would you encourage us by meeting us at the dead places in our life, at the places where we expect you to maybe not be as alive and active, and may you come us alongside us and teach us something and send us out in the power of your spirit. God, thank you for those who are coming today to profess their faith. May their profession bring honor and glory to you and embolden and encourage those who hear it. In Christ's name, amen. Friends, as you go from this place today, we recognize that there are plenty of places where we could camp out around the dead things in our life that have caused us guilt and shame, or we could follow in mission the one who died not only to redeem us, but to give this life purpose. So as you go from this place today, may you live with the purpose that was given you in Christ. I would invite you to show some love to Noah and Devin and Cadence today. If you know them, come up, give them a hug, high five them, congratulate them. They are the newest members of Christ's body by profession of faith, and that is something worth celebrating. As we go from this place, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my friends, the church must leave the building. You are dismissed.